We, we think, therefore we are. We are, therefore we do. We do, therefore we invent. And oh, we invent. Right from the beginning, we've been inventing for the basics, for the revolutionary, for the thing of beauty and wonder, to constantly recreate and reimagine the world we live in. And those inventions, they've made the world easier, richer, more fulfilling, more right for everybody. And each of them began just as a thought, a moment of, hmm, what if, followed by a determined, why not? In that moment, an inventor is born, and the key to their success lies in the unusual idea they don't dismiss. It lies in their courage to challenge the status quo. It lies in the way they blend science, process, creativity, and hard work. It lies in their foresight that what I do today will have a lasting impact on the world. It lies in that magical moment when their idea stops being radical and becomes commonplace, difficult to live without, normal. And with that idea, they changed the world into what they imagined it could be. At TCS Research, we seek out and nurture these thinkers and doers. We aspire to create those life-changing, business-changing, humanity-changing inventions with scientists and researchers and experts from across industries and disciplines. We collaborate to make people healthier, to provide clean energy, to make the digital world safer so that from different corners of the world, more inventors can have their moment of, hmm, what if, why not? We invent for today, for tomorrow, and for the tomorrow after that, to create the future that's ours to shape to make an impact on everything there is and on everything yet to come. Hello, folks. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the globe. Um, my name is uh, Venkatesh Sarangan. I am a TCS Research. It's my pleasure to invite all of you for another edition of uh, uh, webinar being organized by ACM India and TCS Research. The purpose of this webinar is to take uh, cutting edge topics and simplify it for a common audience and discuss the research issues involved for the scientific community. It involves students, you know, practitioners from academia, industry, etc. The topic for today's webinar is a very, I would say, interesting one and a challenging one in the sense, you know, it really involves people from a lot of disciplines, computing, controls, communications, etc. The topic is energy internet. Uh, how do we make today's power system or the energy network, quote unquote, more sustainable? How do we run this network using clean energy sources? Okay, that's the question we are trying to ask today. Uh, it's a very difficult question to ask, answer, and we need a lot of brilliant minds across the world to you know, find an answer for this. Unfortunately, we have amidst today we have with us some of those brilliant minds who are who would be sharing their thoughts on how we could sort of go about answering some of these questions in their own unique way. Okay, so this webinar has sort of two parts to it. The first part consists of a keynote wherein we have one of our distinguished uh, you know, researchers will sort of uh, talk about a specific research problem, and following that we will have a panel or a fireside chat wherein we will have a set of distinguished panelists, again, talking about various aspects of the same problem. Okay, so just to give us a holistic perspective across from across the globe. Okay, so we thought probably, you know, in the interest of time, let's go on. And before we go on to the keynote, maybe we will have a short presentation from ACM on the work they are doing in India. Uh, over to ACM folks. Thank you, uh, Venkatesh. Good evening to all of you and welcome to this sixth session of uh, quarterly uh, webinar series uh, jointly organized by uh, TCS Research, ACM India Council and ACM I6CAC chapter, where you get to listen to some of the most eminent technologies who work in the intersection of fascinating topics such as renewable energy, AI, smart grid and sustainability who will be sharing their insights. I'm Chitra Babu, past chair of ACM I6 CSC chapter, the Indian counterpart of the Special Interest Group on Computer Science Education, as well as Computer Science and Engineering at SSN College of Engineering, Chennai. 
Let me take a couple of minutes now to brief you about ACM India. Uh, simply said, ACM's mission is to promote computing as a science and profession. Let me give some examples of what being associated with ACM means to you. You will be part of world's largest computing society. ACM India is spread across the country through its members and chapters. You can access ACM's resources either as an individual or as a chapter. In terms of promoting research, in terms of uh, promoting research, ACM India has taken research initiatives such as PhD clinic, where the PhD scholars get an opportunity to discuss their research with faculty and industry researchers. Anveshan Setu, where the PhD scholars get to spend a duration of four weeks with a researcher of their choice at their campus to get an immersive research experience. Among the multiple education initiatives of ACM India, summer and winter schools on emerging topics have proven to be very beneficial to students. We also work with the whole spectrum of institutions in the education sphere, starting from policy making bodies such as AACT to schools at grassroots level to increase the quality of computing education. When it comes to many resources for individual professional development, you may have come across the eminent speaker program, ACM India webinars, mini graphs, and of course the ACM digital library to mention a few. To, to acknowledge and provide visibility to outstanding contributions from India, ACM India has instituted reputed awards in various categories, doctoral dissertation award, best performing student chapter award, Outstanding Contributions to Computing Education Award, Outstanding Contributions to Computing by Women Award and Early Career Researcher Award. The special interest groups in India organize prestigious national level conferences and symposiums like COD, SCOMAD, ISEC, and COMPUTE. ACM India annual event is the flagship event, which is organized at different locations every year with its co-located events such as PhD Symposium and ACMW events. Now, in inclusion, equity, and uh, diversity plays an integral part of all, all our activities, uh, leading, leading to diversity in the representation, whether it is on gender, geography, educational institutions, or career paths. In particular, ACMW India focuses on empowerment and advancement of women in computing. Hope I have been able to describe what ACM India stands for. I would like to invite you to come, participate, contribute, and advance your career. I encourage those who are not ACM members yet to become members soon to become part of this community and start contributing. I also encourage those who are interested in computer science education to become members of I6CSE chapter. This membership is completely free. I'm sure you'll enjoy today's session and find a lot of takeaways. Thank you very much. Over to you, Venkatesh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chitra Babal. It was very, I'm sure people will find it very useful to know about um, ACM. And now, the first main event of the day, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar Kalyanaraman. Shiv in short. Shiv is the CTO of Energy and Mobility at Microsoft Research and also R&D India and also for Azure Global. Before joining Microsoft, uh, he was an executive general manager in GE Power Conversion, where again, he focused on e-mobility e and distributed solar businesses. And before GE, he had a very uh, stellar career with IBM Research, where he was uh, leading um, you know, energy research in I IBM Research India. Before IBM, I know uh, he was a faculty at Rainsler Polytechnic Institute in Troy. Uh, so, which means he understands about academia as well as uh, corporate research quite well. And he got his PhD from Ohio State in 1997 in networking. And he got he was, was, was one of the top 100 Young Innovators Award uh, of the New Millennium instituted by MIT's Technology Review Magazine. He got this in 1999. And he served as the a, a Technical Program Committee Co-Chair for Infocom. Uh, 2008. It's a very prestigious conference in networking, and he was the uh, general chair, co-general chair of ACM CICOM, a flagship conference of ACM in, in networking. So he has been on the board of ACM Transactions and Networking, and he's a fellow of IEEE, 
and an ACM distinguished scientist. Very recently, he he was he got the uh, he was made a fellow of uh, INAE, Indian National Academy of Engineering. So thank you so much, Shiv, for joining us. And he he will now talk about how AI and software is sort of shaping up the future of clean energy. Over to you, Shiv. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Venkatesh, and thank you to ACM. Thank you to um, uh, TCS Research for um, having me. Let me figure out how to make this small. Huh. Okay, so I can interrupt this. Okay, maybe this. Yeah, sorry. My apologies. <clears throat> Okay, um, yeah, so uh, without any further ado, um, I've had the uh, you know, uh, pleasure of working both in networking, the internet technologies as well as energy uh, for almost half my career each uh, and also half in academia, half in industry. So I hope to bring some of these perspectives. Uh, this talk is about um, how the future of 24 seven clean energy is gonna be a lot more software and AI driven than the last 20, 30 years of, uh, of clean energy evolution. Uh, this work is uh, done <clears throat> along with lots of my colleague, uh, colleagues across uh, Microsoft, um, Microsoft Research in Redmond in India uh, and uh, different parts of uh, Microsoft as well. <clears throat> so I'm part of Microsoft Energy Industry. Um, I serve as the CTO here. So first, um, you know, the broad context is that um, the, uh, if you think about climate change, um, it is driven by the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, and if you want to bend the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions to below two degrees centigrade and ultimately to one and a half degrees centigrade and ultimately to net zero uh, GHG emissions uh, by sometime uh, in the coming decades, uh, you have to see what, co what constitutes these greenhouse gas emissions and what is driving these emissions. It turns out that energy uh, constitutes almost 70 plus percent, 73 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, right? So you cannot solve the climate change problem without addressing energy head on. And it turns out that um, the, the major vector for decarbonization of energy is a three-step formula, right? And the first formula is to electrify uh, energy, okay, uh, uh, rather than using combustion to deliver energy or to do energy conversion, you have electric, uh, electric based energy. So uh, what that means is uh, electric vehicles, electric heating, <clears throat> and then conversion of other forms of use uh, to, um, you know, uh, power electronics and, and electric based um, uh, use of energy. This happens to be a more efficient in itself. And then of course, you can add a layer of energy efficiency. The second step is to decarbonize the supply side of energy, which means adoption of renewables. And it turns out that the cheapest forms of renewables, solar and wind are getting cheaper by the day. And it also happens to be highly volatile. If you had a cheap source of energy that was not volatile, it would have been a much simpler problem. But unfortunately, it turns out that the cheaper source of renewables are also, uh, are also highly volatile. right? And uh, to manage this volatility, when you have a highly volatile supply side meeting an increasingly volatile demand side, uh, you you have a supply chain that connects demand to supply, and the first thing we learn in supply chains and queuing theory is that if you have a highly volatile demand, highly volatile supply, you uh, you either build up a large queue. This is first thing we learn in queuing theory in uh, in networking, or you're going to have instabilities very quickly if you don't if you're not able to buffer. <clears throat> and uh, the electricity grid, you don't have the ability to buffer, or the amount of buffers or storage on the grid is very very small, less than one percent. <clears throat> Uh, so what this means is that you have to actually have digital technologies which can instrument demand, instrument supply, and then provide various mechanisms to match this demand and supply, not just at the present, but also in, into the future, into forward, through forward markets, through a variety of technologies to adapt demand, adapt supply, and uh, match this. And finally, when you come to the real-time operations, uh, have a set of sophisticated real-time techniques as well to match demand and supply. So think of this as a fundamentally managing volatility by proactively matching demand and supply 24 by seven, every minute, every second, and all the way to microseconds, right? So that's the challenge of, um, of uh, driving deep decarbonization. If you do not do this, uh, renewables will be self-limiting. In other words, as you, pay, as you have greater penetration of renewables, um, <clears throat> um, it will become e even more harder to drive further penetration. 
right? But the good news is from a, a market perspective, uh, the costs have been coming down rapidly. And uh, from a demand perspective, the uh, demand for electrons or uh, the uh, electric power demand is gonna go up uh, over, and especially in non-OECD countries. And the, um, there's gonna be both an aggregate increase in supply of renewables, as well as a market share shift from um, other fossil fuel based technologies to renewable technologies, right? So, um, so uh, the key hypothesis here is that the first wave of renewable deployment was driven by three major things. One was hardware, which is uh, costs of uh, solar panels, wind turbines and the like. Uh, dropping fast and uh, continues to drop. And this is due to learning curves, experience curves, uh, you know, emergence of supply chains and the like. Um, and, uh, and of course, huge R&D um, uh, investments, huge policy investments, huge manufacturing investments and globalization of manufacturing. And uh, what is not uh, uh, that well understood is there's a huge amount of financial investment or financial innovation that, that drove um, this. So think of this as the phase one of, uh, of deployment of renewables. And that has gotten us globally to about um, between 10 and 20% in different parts of the world of uh, renewables um, you know, meeting demand right, or electricity demand. So that was cheaper, but going forward, because you have volatile um, supply meeting volatile demand, and also the nature of volatility is also changing. The, of course, we all, all know that the sun rises at a given time in the day and sets at a given time, but of course the nature of clouds and others are driven by climate change. Um, extreme events, the nature of wind patterns are driven by climate. So, uh, so the actual production is going to be highly dependent on, on processes or the nature uh, of randomness uh, is, uh, is also going to be a challenge. It's going to be non-stationary processes which you have to deal with. And markets where you have both um, uh, this non-stationary process meaning meeting human agents and so on, right? So uh, this picture on the right, it's a bit small here, but uh, as you go from uh, the 10, 20% renewables where we are today to the future where you're gonna have 50 to 80% or greater uh, penetration of renewables, uh, by definition, you're gonna have lesser of the other stuff, right? The non-renewable section, which means uh, you will not have the other resources available to balance the volatility of uh, the what the renewables uh, cause. So renewables have to step up and take control of their own volatility and uh, manage that, which means that there's uh, increasing responsibility on renewables to better match to demand. And they will, uh, there are economic incentives for that. They will get paid only if they match to demand. Uh, otherwise, they'll not get paid, right? And this is an, uh, a concept of 24 7 power. Just like when you use power today, when you click uh, switch on your uh, electric uh, appliances or you turn on your AC. Uh, you only pay for the power that you use, right? So whereas uh, the older regime in renewables is uh, I produce power whenever the sun shines or the wind blows, and then it's your job to manage it, uh, you know, in, in your job demand to meet my supply. But, uh, you know, right now the balance is pendulum is shifting back, and therefore uh, there is a need for the whole system to become a lot more smarter. What that means is uh, the ability to uh, measure demand, measure supply, forecast demand, forecast supply, and deal with uncertainty and take decisions under uncertainty and provide matching, right? And then deal with residual uncertainty and uh, provide, uh, you know, uh, and provide compensation for the matching and ultimately power, power controls and uh, closer to real time, right? So this is what we mean by smarter, uh, uh, which you can accomplish through software, data, and AI. And uh, uh, thankfully, there's been a lot of technologies on this on this digital side, which have also grown rapidly over the last uh, decade. Cloud computing, uh, the growth of AI technologies, and the growth of streaming uh, data from IoT, and all the costs have been dropping as well, right? So we are leveraging all the low cost capabilities, and but now um, the future is uh, to make this happen. And this is uh, also critically important because if we don't do this, uh, you will not have the high penetration of renewables that you want. And again, that links back to climate change. So, um, uh, and so if you take that uh, hypothesis to be true, what we are trying to do in the industry is uh, to help drive a digital energy transition to a company, the physical energy transition to enable deep renewables integration. And uh, to uh, what we mean by this digitization is uh, digitization of the data, uh, uh, trying to understand when the demand is, uh, is ready, when the supply is ready, uh, how, and also trying to understand when the demand will be ready and when the supply will be ready, managing the flexibility embedded in demand supply um, and uh, matching these things, right? So this turns out to be a set of uh, transactional capabilities to be able to measure demand and supply and match them. Uh, that we call a 24 seven matching capability. 
uh, the ability to forecast demand, which is to con convert unknown unknowns to more like known unknowns or risk curves, uh, that's forecasting. And then how do I do data-driven decision-making or autonomous decision-making under uncertainty, which uh, uh, involves the use of uh, advanced uh, concepts uh, such as deep reinforcement learning or other areas, uh, including robust optimization and other methods, stochastic uh, programming and so on. Uh, so that you can orchestrate assets, you can do energy trading uh, in much more sophisticated ways, make demand and supply meet. And then finally, uh, since you're going to have a large amount of decentralized assets, uh, you've got to manage them. So you'll have less and less humans, more robots like uh, drones and the like around, or you know, a large solar farm or a wind farm might be managed by a very uh, small handful of people. So you, you're going to have uh, remote operation centers, which are going to be uh, uh, providing rich uh, assistance to the folks who are managing things on the ground. So we expect to have more natural and multimodal interaction between humans, assets, and robots, right? So, and uh, uh, there's a new set of technologies which you're all familiar with, chat GPT, and uh, new methods of uh, image and other sort of multimedia. I'll give you some ideas of what we're doing there. So all these uh, natural interactions, rich interactions are gonna become enabled, right? So finally, uh, the cloud itself uh, becomes a form of flexible demand. The cloud itself can flex uh, its use of power. And as you have more and more cloud uh, deployment, uh, you can actually uh, take the cloud and move it closer to clear renewables and you can flex the cloud so that it behaves uh, not just as a computing resource, but also as an energy storage resource or a flexibility resource simultaneously, right? So uh, this cap capability has always been there in the cloud, but the ability to orchestrate is uh, something we are looking into, right? So this is a sort of a roadmap of some of the things we are looking into. Um, and to support that, uh, what we at Microsoft are doing is to help take the cloud technologies that are available and they are continually becoming better and uh, put them together as uh, industry frameworks, right? Uh, which means uh, how do I integrate um, the ability to, um, you know, do a forecasting for solar, for wind, for price, or to detect anomalies uh, in, in, in a very, uh, uh, you know, sort of difficult conditions or to do root cause analysis or to uh, predict micro weather, et cetera. Right. And uh, how to put together these uh, solutions very quickly, because there is a lot of uh, different types of forecasts that the industry uh, needs uh, and, uh, and uh, to enable uh, what we call digital twins. Right? So this is one set of capabilities. And then once you have the forecasting, how do I actually use that to actually drive decisions under uncertainty? Right? How do I take decisions under uncertainty? How do I revise decisions under uncertainty? And then how do I uh, do finally control decisions under uncertainty? Right? So things like microgrids, power plant controls, managing energy storage, um, uh, trading across multiple markets. Uh, if you're operating a market, how do I operate multiple markets? How do I solve uh, more and more complex optimization problems in real time? How do I do more data-driven, machine learning-driven, uh, you know, optimal power flow controls and things like that, right? So there's a range of decision uh, challenges that are out there, uh, which uh, we are enabling the cloud infrastructure for and the AI infrastructure for. And finally, there is uh, areas like 24-7 uh, demand supply matching at ever, ever shorter and shorter periods of time. Um, uh, today, there are a concept called RECs or uh, renewable energy certificates that are traded. Uh, there is an increasing uh, growth of um, early stage growth of something called early match renewable certificates, where if you are operating, say, an EV charging hub, you can actually go to the market and buy an early rec, which means uh, it's uh, it, it gives you that the fact that it gives you certification that you are buying electrons that have been generated in the same uh, time or the same hour as you demand, right? So, and um, so there is a need to continue matching demand and supply in smaller and smaller intervals. So we have five minute matching available and over time there'll be, um, you know, a final grain matching <clears throat> for uh, different use cases. Uh, then uh, there are newer technologies around geospatial AI, around vision AI, and um, uh, multimodal, um, you know, interactions uh, through knowledge management and so on. So, of course, many of you know what's going on with uh, ChatGPT, but what you may be less familiar with is OpenAI has put out other frameworks for images, for uh, other sorts of uh, things like audio voice and other things. So, we are currently integrating all of that and making it available, especially for problems in the industry, uh, for, to enable faster uh, penetration of renewables. Right. So, uh, so we're working with a number of partners uh, across the globe uh, to. De deliver this to customers and uh, continually innovating in this framework layer. So I'll give you a, like a quick whistle top, whistle stop tour of all of these. And uh, you know, um, if you're interested, please do contact, contact me on LinkedIn, or uh, if you'd like to chat further, I'll be happy to. 
So um, first, 24-7, the um, basic, very simple idea, in fact, Microsoft was a pioneer in uh, when we wanted to procure renewables uh, capacity from uh, other renewable players, we said that, hey, we're not just going to provide a vanilla contract to you. We will give a 24-7 matching contract because we want you uh, to pay you when uh, we have demand, right? It turns out the data center tends to have a fairly flat demand profile, but uh, the idea was we uh, developed an infrastructure to measure demand, to measure supply, and then come up with a settlement certificate, which uh, which can be potentially audited, it can be traded, and you can also do it in real time, right? Uh, so that capability to, uh, turned out to be quite valuable because now you can do it uh, at a much larger scale, like for example, a, a utility can aggregate their demand, aggregate their supply, and then provide matching, and then uh, provide uh, auditable matching and uh, settlement matching. And uh, more interestingly, they can uh, now uh, trade this on uh, energy market. So North Pole and some other uh, parts of the world in, in the US and PJM, for example, some trading has started in these 24-7 um, uh, RECs and energy tax, right? And uh, this uh, is also going to become mandatory for green hydrogen. So if you want to have green hydrogen that you want to export from India to other parts of the world, uh, so you have to actually uh, show that you uh, you produce the green hydrogen when, uh, uh, you know, with a, a 24 seven tag or an early um, certificate tag. And, um, you know, there are some additional constraints like additionality and deliverability uh, constraints. So for the EU and um, US, there is emerging requirements for that. So uh, so, yeah, so this goes beyond uh, just a foreign utility problem. It's become, becoming more and more um, uh, interesting, right? So this is also driving new business innovation as uh, uh, cloud providers like Microsoft and others uh, are, um, are becoming uh, a big uh, procurement players in renewables and uh, our best practices are being adopted by other, uh, other customers as well. So coming to forecasting, uh, forecasting is the art of, um, you know, there's a, a saying that whatever I forecast is going to be wrong. Uh, forecasting is, um, you know, especially hard, uh, you know, especially hard if you're trying to forecast the future, right? Uh, but the challenge here is that uh, you can't uh, forecast the future with any, uh, you know, sort of a degree of precision, but you can sort of try to convert complete unknown unknowns to what we call known unknowns or put a risk curve around it. So that way you can manage risk as opposed to um, dealing with uncertainties where you have complete, uh, uh, you know, lack of understanding. So given that, one of the challenges we saw is that people were focusing on forecasting as a point problem, uh, trying to develop a bespoke load forecast or a bespoke solar forecast. And then when they want to uh, use the forecast for another solar farm and so on, it became extremely difficult. You had to do the whole, whole process all over again. And this is a common problem in AI. Uh, uh, traditionally, AI uh, um, you know, models have been, uh, it took a large amount of time to build it. You have to clean up the data. You have to put the, uh, build the model. The models would be uh, less robust <clears throat> and, um, you know, and uh, you have to keep retraining the models if uh, if there are issues with stationarity, right? It turned out that renewable forecasting has the perfect cocktail of all these problems, right? So you have data that's often uh, not the best. Uh, sometimes the, you don't have enough depth of data. You have data quality issues. You have um, a, a non-stationarity in the behaviors and so on. So the, uh, one of the uh, things that we learned in wireless communications and other areas is to exploit diversity, right? So uh, in fact, there's something called diversity gain when you learn a wireless communication. So similarly, what we are trying to do is to uh, exploit data diversity and also model diversity to be able to solve this problem. And, and as you have more and more data, you can use uh, more sophisticated models like deep learning models and so on. But these uh, models are harder to maintain and so on. So we, uh, as Microsoft, we decided that we will build a framework that allows and brings both open source uh, frameworks as well as a state of the art frameworks we have developed internally or um, models, as well as enable uh, partners or uh, customers to take um, you know, inputs of data, both from their own sources, as suppose you have your own IoT data source, as well as external providers who have weather forecasts uh, or uh, who have specific other forecasts, which you can take and then fuse that to develop um, better and better models. Right? So we think of modeling and forecasting as a journey, as opposed to um, as a point solution. And also once we have this framework in place, it becomes very easy to stamp out new solutions for forecasting because we are seeing that customers want to forecast newer and newer things. They want to forecast what is the net supply after you have serviced a 24 seven power purchase agreement. What is the uh, uh, you know forecast at a transformer or what is the load forecast at a, uh, you know, for a distributed energy resource? There is all kinds of uh, uh, different forecasting planning uh, horizons uh, that are of interest, right? So uh, what we see is a thousand flowers blooming in terms of the kinds of forecasting and the need for forecasting to uh, get better and better, okay? So over time, we'll have large language models helping in forecasting and so on and so forth, right? So, uh, so we are helping try to manage this. 
And uh, part of this is to bring state-of-the-art forecasting. Here's an example of a piece of work we did uh, in Microsoft Research uh, called Deep MC. Deep MC stands for Deep Learning Applied to Microclimate Forecasting. Um, and uh, this can also support ensembling of models from not just our model, whereas uh, uh, with, along with other uh, models. Uh, the way it handles non-stationarity is to decompose the time series into multiple scales and provide uh, separate uh, deep learning pipelines for each scale that is customized uh, for that, right? And uh, uh, as the technology has evolved, we have evolved the framework. Uh, initially, we used um, you know CNNs and LSTMs for different scales, and now we're using transformers uh, and so on. Uh, so as the technology evolves, we can evolve the framework as well, right? And um, so uh, uh, this, if you apply it, and uh, we have uh, applied it in a variety of customers as well as open source data, it shows the you know uh, both improvement. Uh, I think the key message from the slide is that if you just try to do simple forecasting of something as volatile as wind, um, uh, you know it becomes very difficult. In fact, uh, people who are doing wind forecasting, they not only want average errors to be better, they also want to forecast at periods where they can make more money on the energy markets, or they want to forecast ramps better so that way they can operate their storage or ancillary services better, etc. So there are many other challenges challenges in these forecasting. So, um, so the way we provide improvements is both through model improvements as well as uh, uh, fusion of multiple data sources, the diversity point I mentioned, right? So that's just a quick message on that forecasting, but we can use the same or uh, a similar model uh, and apply it to uh, other forecasts. We've done solar forecasts, we've done load forecasts, and there's an example of a price forecasting where we used a slightly different model where we uh, uh, model spatial dependencies um, in addition to temporal behavior. So think of this as a spatial temporally informed forecast and uh, which again uh, provides a much better forecast than if, uh, if I just focus on a single time series, for example. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so exploiting, um, uh, you know, external data, exploiting uh, external uh, physics-based models, exploiting spatial temporal dependencies, all of these are becoming interesting in forecasting. And so our goal is to uh, help the evolution of these forecasts too, as we go forward. So if you uh, peek under the hood, um, you know, what we provide is a whole range of templates, uh, data abstraction, so that we can integrate with various data sources, uh, exploratory data analysis that is matched to these problems of wind, solar, and other forecasts, um, uh, ability to uh, put together workflows, ability to orchestrate cloud resources, uh, have various uh, models, both our in-house models as well as open source models, and automating the MLOps, uh, which is sort of like a DevOps for machine learning. And so that way, uh, you know, as you you have data drift or uh, you know non stationarities that pop up that have not been captured in the model, uh, you can adapt and retrain the models, etc. Right. So uh, so you can model this sort of constant maintenance of those models in a highly automated way, um, and uh, you can also do provenance, figure out what happens when um, things go wrong. Uh, you know, you can do due diligence around that. So this is an example of uh, why the hidden challenges in AI are actually uh, in building this model and managing the life cycle, right? So that's uh, some of the things we as a cloud provider try to simplify. So similarly, going into decision management. So once you have a forecast, what can you do with it? You want to take a decision. Forecasting by itself is not an end game. You want to do something with the forecast. So you might want to trade. You might want to manage a set of assets, a portfolio of assets. You might want to manage a microgrid. You might want to solve several problems, which involve embedded optimization problems, again, under uncertainty, where you can use stochastic programming, robust optimization, or newer techniques uh, like deep reinforcement learning and so on, data-driven decision making. So you can think of this as layers. What we observed is that many wholesale and retail problems in uh, clean energy. If you're trying to uh, so, you know, operate an EV charging hub, if you're trying to uh, manage a portfolio of multiple farms, like you have uh, hydro facilities in Himachal Pradesh, uh, solar and wind in different parts of India, and you're feeding into the grid, you're meeting a 24 seven contract, you have excess uh, production, you've got to offload that onto energy markets like IEX and so on, right? All of these turns out to have complex um, multi-objective optimization problems. And uh, we don't need to have PhD solving each problem and uh, these problems being brittle, right? So we want to lower the bar by which these problems can be quickly formulated, quickly solved, and maintain these solutions being maintained, right? So similar to forecasting, where we're try trying to do sophisticated forecasting, how do we enable uh, sophisticated optimization for the industry um, uh, beyond, you know, what uh, you might get in open source and Gorobi or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, the basic solvers, right? So the way we handled it is to have a set of abstractions, again, industry abstraction layer. So we have an abstraction for solar, for wind, for storage. Uh, think of it as uh, like a small, like a digital twin of each of those, but uh, relevant for the optimization problem. And we have also a digital twin of the markets, so like a, a for a day ahead market, intraday market and stuff like that. 
And then uh, we are going to be expanding it to ancillary services market. And then how you can take that and take on the right side, you see a set of uh, machinery for optimization, um, you know, classic, um, you know, linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, reinforcement learning, uh, you know, robust optimization and the like. And we'll keep sweeping in newer techniques and then bringing that together in a simple, uh, you know, plug and play format uh, where you can formulate problems, you can deal with relaxation issues and so on in a much more simplified manner in an environment here, right? So uh, again, going forward, we hope to uh, add a natural language uh, uh, layer where if you just say what you want and the, you know, the formulation takes care of itself, right? So that's our goal, but uh, we're still not quite there. So with this, uh, we are able to formulate actually very sophisticated problems and make it super easy. Um, so for example, we are working with uh, one of our customers who has a 24 seven contract, uh, which um, they are selling to the federal agencies. And this is called a round, round the clock contract in India. Um, and this is a primary contract. But then uh, they uh, also have excess production uh, because they have over-provisioned uh, solar and wind and so on. So they, for example, for a 100 megawatt contract AC, they would have uh, probably 100 megawatts of solar, perhaps uh, 100, uh, 200 megawatts of wind, and uh, perhaps some uh, uh, hydro power as well as a backup. And um, you know, obviously at every specific interval, like 15 minutes or five minutes, uh, they would be producing more uh, than what uh, you have con contracted, which means you're not gonna get paid by that contract. So you have to um, actually offload that onto energy markets. So, and you can't wait till the last moment to offload it because you may not have the liquidity. Uh, so you have to offload it into the future, which means you have to predict how much net production you're gonna do. And uh, that is an uncertain quantity. You'll have a risk of, if you don't meet that, you're gonna get, pay, uh, you know, you're gonna be charged a fine and those penalties are also increasing, right? So this is a perfect cocktail of all the kinds of things that can go wrong. So uh, so uh, how do you do monetization under uncertainty in, this, in these conditions, right? So, and how do you manage a portfolio of, um, uh, you know, distributed solar, wind, and these are distributed in a wholesale sense, right? You can have a solar in Rajasthan, a wind in Tamil Nadu, and uh, you have um, you know, storage in Himachal Pradesh, for example. And there's a multi-market optimization problem. It's a multi-objective problem. It's under uncertainty. <clears throat> and it's obviously on convex and all the good stuff, right? So, uh, so again, uh, another example of a problem we are working with, um, uh, with a uh, customer in the US is to manage a network of uh, hydro power facilities. One of them is a pumped hydro, the other is a regular hydro. How do you jointly optimize this for compliance, for monetization, for efficiency, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, maximizing the life, right? Operational constraints. So these are examples of complex problems. Solving this in a bespoke way uh, is a challenge, but these problems also need to continually evolve, right? So we are trying to lower the bar and provide cloud-based building blocks uh, with which you can formulate these problems uh, quickly, flexibly, and you can evolve these over time. Okay, finally, um, uh, I'll talk about the hot topic of the day, which is uh, multimodal interactions, you know, uh, chat GPT and, uh, and so on, right? The setup is that uh, you're gonna have these farms which are gonna be distributed and you're gonna have uh, these remote operation center. We can, we are calling them remote orchestration centers as opposed to operation centers. They are gonna have rich interactions uh, and um, these assets which are there, say offshore uh, wind and or uh, solar in, in somewhere in the desert and so on, you may or may not have fiber optic cables there directly, but increasingly you have satellite-based fiber capabilities or satellite-based very high-speed uh, Leo orbit satellites uh, that are coming up like Starlink and others, which are, uh, you know, give you very high uh, bandwidth connectivity to uh, these locations, right? And uh, what that means is that you can actually transmit uh, real-time data at low latency and uh, you can actually interact uh, with the uh, live field folks uh, with, um, you know, with digital twins, with um, uh, much more holograms or other things, right? So uh, how do we do that? And at the same time, have more natural interaction. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. And uh, so if you look at uh, the area of large language models and so on, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So machine learning, you can think of as a subset of the more broader area of artificial intelligence. And what we talked about recently about deep learning is a subset of that. And finally, generative AI and these what are called language models and large language models are again, a subset of uh, deep learning models, right? As the model sizes have become large, they start having emerging properties and they start blurring the boundaries between you know, natural language processing and other areas of uh, AI. So uh, let me give you an area which is not the classic chat GPT, right? In a chat GPT where uh, is you'll interact with, give a text uh, input and you get back a text output, right? And uh, this is rapidly changing. Um, so think of, uh, you know, when you look at a vision AI task, you have a drone that goes picks a picture, you have a, a classic vision task as a image segmentation, uh, um, which is saying, hey, is this image a dog's picture? If you have a semantic segmentation saying this pixel, uh, is this a part of a cloud? This is a part of a sky, et cetera, right? If you're doing a sky camera, you have 
instance segmentation, visual anomaly detection with a, in a thermal uh, image or other sorts of images. You can have an RGB image as shown on the bottom left where you have soiling and you're able to pick that up. Or you have a thermal image of a wind turbine's blade and you're trying to pick out a small um, you know, crack or emerging uh, problems in the blade. You're looking at uh, electroluminescence image of a solar panel and trying to figure out where the faults are within inside the, the depths of a cell, right? It could be a micro crack and so on. So the uh, tasks are varied. Your image types are varied. You have RGB, thermal electroluminescence, multispectral imaging from satellites and so on. And you have different types of assets. You have solar, you have wind, you have inverters, you have transformers and so on. And you have uh, you know power system uh, capabilities. So the interesting question in front of us is, can we have a universal uh, vision AI capability, right? And we typically what has happened is that we've had to build separate models for all of these um, topics. But what's emerging uh, in the large language model area is it is becoming possible to have a more of a universal model where you build one model uh, and pre-train it and then evolve it uh, so that way it can support all these tasks, right? And that's a promise. We are not yet there. Uh, uh, currently, our teams are working on some of these, and I just want to give you a glimpse of what the future is bringing, right? So to give you an idea, uh, you know, you build this, uh, you know, there is a, a model as part of OpenAI called Clip, which are using that. Currently, there are other foundational vision models as well. Okay, so we are training it with a variety of uh, data. In fact, we collected all this data during the old age of uh, you know classic machine learning models. Uh, but then uh, rather than training in the traditional sense, we are actually doing few shot learning or we are doing fine tuning with uh, orders of magnitude lesser data and uh, with a more diverse data set. So the, as you can see, again, the theme of diversity of data sets and diversity of asset types. And now that gives you the generality and uh, effectively transfer learning that you're able to apply it for a variety of problems, right? So uh, these are just initial results that show that, uh, you know, you can do fairly interesting things across the class, a wide variety of uh, data sets and data types, right? But this again, work in progress. So wanted to give you an idea. So we also have internal partnerships with Microsoft Research across the world in Redmond, uh, in India and in China and, um, and other parts. And and you know, I want to thank our uh, colleagues and all of the place. And you can see these are uh, announcements. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff: uh, Visual Chat GPT, Farm Vibes, uh, you know, something which is a geospatial toolkit that's been put out, and uh, you know, multimodal uh, tools that have been put out, and of course, uh, OpenAI tools that are available through Azure AI. Okay. Finally, I'll just leave you with a thought that um, ultimately, in addition to doing all this AI to manage the grid and to uh, help autonomous operations for the future, the cloud itself can be a flexibility resource. The way you think about that is. Uh, uh, you know, data centers are essentially computational resources. And as you do more AI, as you do more high performance computing and things like that, you consume a lot more power. However, that power consumption can also be flexible and you can move uh, this all the way to a renewable energy farm. Today, data centers are strategically located. They are very big and uh, they are aggregated, but we can imagine a decentralized, like a distributed, um, you know, sort of resource where you have smaller data centers that actually go and land in a, a solar farm or a wind farm and they co-locate. And uh, you uh, provide not just a computational capability, but you can also provide flexibility. And what's interesting is you can actually, through virtualization and other methods, you can actually recreate a more uh, reliability abstraction on top. Interestingly, this was an example of a renewable energy piece of work that we published in a networking conference, right? Uh, which is very interesting for this theme of uh, today. Okay, so I'll not go through all the details of this, but the idea is to go from a centralized data center to a concept of a virtual battery, which is a data center that is um, co-located with renewables. Um, and it you can now even put it in remote um, offshore uh, wind farms and have satellite connectivity. So you, you use that and uh, you can shift computation to where the energy is available, where the green energy is available. And as and also you can flex as a battery would, uh, uh, you know, in, you're essentially flexing demand as opposed to flexing supply at a very quick, uh, very fast rate, right? So what is interesting is you can uh, actually do operating system scheduling much faster uh, and uh, quickly uh, go up and down, uh, essentially providing ancillary services to the grid. So uh, to do this, actually, it involves integration of lots of technologies that are some of which are out there, like uh, we have a partnership with uh, Starlink and others to provide space technologies. We have packaging technologies to put a small data center in a, in a, in a container. Uh, we have um, uh, you know circular cloud technologies to leverage uh, depreciated servers and repackage them into these uh, form factors. We have Harvest VM, which is a workload scheduler which actually does uh, rapid workload scheduling uh, to provide that flexibility of not just uh, compute, but also flexibility 
flexibility of power. In other words, you turn on and off servers, or you can actually flex the power usage of servers dynamically. And as well as you can have a grid computing where you can uh, dispatch workloads, uh, training workloads, test workloads, HPC workloads uh, to all these things. And ultimately, you can participate in multiple spot markets, uh, energy markets, and uh, compute markets, and then look at these as essentially uh, optimization problem under uncertainty using the tools I talked about earlier. Okay, this is an example uh, again on the project which is underway in partnership with Microsoft Research. Okay, so finally to sum it up, renewables is the lowest cost and it's uh, very important for it to penetrate at a large scale to make a difference. Uh, and uh, so the cost curves of all of this will continue to uh, relentlessly come down, right? So that's not in question. However, uh, as the costs come down, there will be greater demand for renewables. And um, But as there's a greater demand for renewables, it'll also uh, introduce a lot of externalities on the grid. Same thing with electric vehicles and so on, right? But the opportunity is to leverage the flexibility inherent the, and uh, digital technologies can provide that. And uh, also financing is also evolving to uh, drive more and more finance into these areas. Um, and the growth of electricity markets, the growth of digital and the growth of flexibility uh, can help you manage all of these together. And we believe that this digital energy transition is as important as the physical energy transition and it really an enabler of this. So with that, I want to thank you and uh, give the floor back to Vendikesh. Thank you. Oh, and thank you so much, Shiv. I mean, really, I mean, thanks a lot for this excellent talk. I mean, as a computer scientist at this, I feel happy that uh, I will have some work to do for the next Five years or ten years, you know, <laughs> you longer than that. <laughs> so I'm sure many of us will carry this thought forward. Thank you so much once again. And maybe what we will do is, in case you have any questions for Shiv, please feel free to share uh, on the chat box that you have, and then we will relay it to Shiv for him to respond back uh, either today or probably sometime later, depending on the time. Okay. Now we'll move on to you know the next part of our uh, program, which is again a panel discussion. Um, Shiv talked about one aspect of the energy internet, which is about intelligence and decision making. There are a lot of other aspects which are sort of equally important, like how do we uh, run the network? How do we make it resilient? Uh, how do we make the network secure? Uh, how do we enhance the network? So on and so forth, which involves a lot of um, you know, perspectives from electrical engineering, power systems, IT, and so on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite a set of panelists who will join Shiv in answering some of the questions that we may have on these topics. So Shiv is our first panelist. Uh, let me now introduce uh, the next panelist, Dr. Dr. Kannan Tiniam. Uh, Dr. Kannan is a senior vice president R&D and uh, he's from uh, Luminous Power Technologies Division of Schneider. He's an industry veteran. He has more than 25 years of experience and uh, as a senior VP of R&D, he's sort of shaping up new product developments for Luminous. And before that, he was with uh, GE uh, Global Research Center, again, uh, holding various positions in power electronics uh, devices and things like that. And he also worked at the other side of the industry at, at Entergy, which is a big utility company in the US. So he understands that aspect of the business as well. And more importantly, he is uh, he served as a chair of uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society of Bangalore chapter, and he co-chaired the World Energy Summit 2020. And he obtained the Outstanding Engineer Award from IEEE PES chapter in 2020. And he got his PhD in electrical engineering from Tulane. Welcome, Khan. Th thanks for joining us. And now we have industry. Now we'll go. go we'll have a lift, you know, bit of. Uh, a difference, a flavor, different flavor. We have Professor Anupama Kohli joining us from IIT Bombay. Uh, professor Kohli is an associate professor uh, at IIT Bombay, and she has more than 16 years of experience working on uh, power systems, control, and economics as well. And one key aspect of our, uh, have, of our research is she has done a lot of projects with industry. So she sort of understands how the industry, um, academia, handshake, how technology transfer takes place, et cetera. So maybe we'll try to hear more from her later on. And she got the Departmental Excellence in Teaching Award from IIT Bombay. And she also received the Prahalad Chabria Award for the best women professional uh, from issued by the Hope Foundation. So well, thank you so much, Professor Kohli, for joining us today. And now we go to other side of the globe 
probably early morning there. Um, I welcome Dr. Shankaran Rajagopal from Minnesota, Minneapolis. Uh, he is a senior director uh, responsible for energy markets, business solutions at Siemens. He is based in the US and he got his PhD in electrical engineering from Iowa State. And he has been Siemens for more than two decades. And he has a rich experience working in different parts of the industry, right from you know building uh, simulation software, uh, training simulators, uh, the black starts and system restoration drills, etc. And he managed a big um, um, you know uh, delivery for uh, uh, Siemens software, which is delivered for California ISO. And he's also interested in you know how to enhance the solutions for new energy like shale gas and storage, etc. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Shankaran, for joining us. And uh, a bit of a startup culture now. I welcome Dr. Prashant Navalkar uh, from Power Answer Labs. Uh, he is uh, director of Power Answer Labs, a startup you know which is incubated at IIT Bombay, and uh, he is also an adjunct associate professor at IIT Bombay Department of Electrical Engineering. And he was with. Uh, Tata Consulting Engineers before joining Power Answer Labs. And I personally know him for some time and uh, I can say that uh, his knowledge of Indian power grid is as good as anyone else I have seen. So uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Navalkar. And uh, maybe the, 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 the glue which is going to bind all the aspects of the industry, you know, the IT. Um, we have uh, Sanjay Prasad, CIO from CESC Power Group. And uh, he, so he's sort of focusing on um, enterprise IT governance and intervening in the enterprise operations through digital technologies and cybersecurity using all the cutting edge tools that he has at disposal. Before joining CESC, he was a CIO for Tata Power. And one, you know, a distinguishing aspect of him is that he sort of, he mentors a lot of startups. He's in, he sort of interacts with them very, you know, quite regularly and then he, takes them along. So he, engage, he engages with them quite well. So he understands their culture as well. He got his B from Jadavpur University and MBA from XLRI. Um, so he got, again, he's a distingu distinguished as well. He got the uh, uh, ISGF, which I presume is uh, International Smart Grids Forum Award 2023 for adopting you know, disruptive solutions. He got the CIO Icon Award in 2022 and Tata Global Investor Award 2015. He is a fellow and a former vice president of Computer Society of India, and he's a senior member of ACM IEEE. So I think we have a very, I would say a stellar panel here. So maybe what I'll do is I'll try to, in the, I see the time, in the interest of time, maybe I'll request the panel, I give some prompts for each of the panelists, and then I, we would love to hear your thoughts on those prompts for five minutes or so. And following that, depending on how the time permits, we will have questions from the audience. Okay, so now maybe the first question is to Dr. Kanan Tinium. Kanan, I mean, um, Shiv talked about rooftop solars, batteries, etc. Okay, I mean, for a simple person, uh, for an outsider, so all these, of course, electric vehicles, okay, so all these are newer loads which are mm -hmm. coming into the power system at the periphery, which we call as a distribution network, okay. Yeah. So it is possible that you know uh, it could overwhelm the you know the, the infrastructure that we have in the periphery. So I just from your experience, I just want to understand: is it indeed the case? And if so, uh, what are the steps that probably companies are doing uh, across the globe to sort of overcome some of these challenges? Over to you. Sure. No, first, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Venkatesh, and you know for giving me the opportunity to share my views on this subject. Uh, after listening to Dr. Shiva's presentation, you know, I'm more than excited, uh, you know, more excited than ever before, right? And very happy to be in the field of uh, electrical power R&D. Now, coming to the electrical power network, you know, I've come more from a, you know, physics perspective, right? I mean, in terms of how the, uh, you know, power grid is and how, you know, the power flows across the network and what are the challenges for, you know, power system engineers, right? Uh, so traditionally, we all knew that uh, you know the power basically gets generated in certain locations, and then they get transmitted over long distances through high voltage transmission lines. And then you have a step down transformer, and you have you know distribution feeders, and then you know uh, the power gets up to the homes. 
Now, the last couple of decades, we have seen tremendous uh, increase in renewables, especially on wind and solar, uh, mostly at the farm level. Uh, that is at the you know transmission level, so so to speak, and uh, you know this has presented a lot of challenges and opportunities for power system engineers as well, right? To handle the intermittencies and I mean uh, and all that. Now coming to the distribution side of it, uh, especially in India, right? I mean we uh, that I would say is among the weakest link in the electrical power okay. network. Okay, one is uh, due to the fact that uh, the utilities are not uh, financially strong. Uh, second is the grid conditions at the distribution uh, levels are are not uh, as strong as you know what it is uh, supposed to be. I mean, you can see all the wires dangling around in in various places and all that, right? And uh, so, if I look at the challenges of a, distrib- uh, of a power engineer in a distribution utility company, right? The first thing that comes to mind is say, you know there is so much of pilferage or there is so much of ATNC losses that are taking place in India. And so, what can we do to, you know, prevent uh, or, you know, uh, eliminate eliminate those? And now, with all the technologies that have, uh, you know, uh, evolved, right? Especially in computing, in sensing, and communication, there is a lot of focus right now on uh, having smart meters in uh, all these uh, customer locations. Uh, today, probably there are a few, uh, like four or five million, you know, smart meters across across India. Uh, but then uh, there is a potential you know, uh, huge potential, right? I mean, to get into 200 plus million uh, smart meters. And the advantage of this is you basically can remotely monitor the energy consumption. You can remotely disconnect. You can have the right kind of meter data management system. You can get all the data back to your distribution control center and it will help you manage your, uh, uh, you know, loads and effectively. Right, so that is one one big uh, big thing. And this, when you have this, the, obviously the losses and and all that uh, will will reduce and the efficiency would increase. The second challenge is the um, fact that uh, whenever cu- customers have outages, right? I mean, they have to distribution utilities have to restore power as fast as possible, right? So there is a lot of development that uh, or focus right now on distribution automation. Uh, including, you know, uh, identifying, you know, where the faults are occurring in the feeders, how fast can we restore, uh, you know, power through automatic feeder uh, reconfiguration. And and there, if you look at uh, some of the technologies there as well, you know, it's it's all about, yeah, you know, having the right kind of sensing across in different places uh, to understand remotely what is happening across the feeder network and so that you can take uh, appropriate actions and uh, restore power back to consumers very fast. The third element, which is uh, a very dynamic element, and it's evolving right now, Dr. Vinkatesh, is this whole concept of, uh, you know, uh, solar and uh, at the distribution level or rather even at the consumer level, right? Uh, solar and storage and, and all that, right? Uh, electric vehicles and so forth. So just to give you a feel, right? I mean, India probably has around 60,000 megawatts of solar across the, across the country. Um, but most of them are, uh, you know, in the farm level. So the residential and small commercial solar level are, you know, kind of just starting their journey. So the next 10 years, you would see a tremendous, tremendous, you know, growth in this particular area, given the fact that we are going to get into almost 300,000 uh, megawatts of solar in the next 10 years. Right. So, so what would happen in this particular case is you are going to have more uh, solar in there. So, as a distribution engineer, right? I mean, you basically are were, you know, concerned about the power coming back into the grid. Basically, are your protection systems capable of handling it? Are you having, you know, the right kind of technology to handle the power quality aspects associated with it? Right. Um, and then when EVs come in, right? I mean, you are talking about people charging electric vehicles, and uh, if they happen at the same time. And they're going to happen at different locations. Today, you may be charging in one place. Tomorrow, you may be charging in a different location. So there's a lot of uncertainty associated with, uh, you know, how the uh, the loads get changed, right? I mean, from uh, from a distribution perspective, right? So there, you know, there has got to be a, a, a detailed, uh, I would say, analysis at, at uh, you know, specific locations that needs to be done to really understand the impact of uh, electric vehicles on the grid. So there are a lot of studies that are going on in various utility companies to really understand the impact of these and uh, you know what uh, they need what the utilities have to do to to address these kind of uh, you know uh, loads I mean this could be like maybe scheduled charging or or other means right energy storage is another mechanism to to uh, address some of these uh, these things right 
Uh, but more importantly, the key point I wanted to share in here is, see, I'm from Luminous Power Technologies, and we are a market leader in, in the power backup inverters and solar inverters and solar solutions at the residential and small commercial level, right? So there, uh, you know, we see that uh, the future of uh, the transformation that is happening in the electricity ecosystem is going to be driven a lot at the consumer level or what we call as a prosumer level. Because until now, you know, it was basically a utility driving all the, you know, calling all the shots. But now it's going to be all the prosumers because if you really see the fact that the cost of solar panel storage and inverters have come down. So now the, this will be much uh, cost effective than your uh, grid power also in some time. Right, and when that happens, then the question is, uh, why shouldn't I go for distributed power in all these, uh, all these, uh, you know, houses and small commercials and all that? So there, what we are also doing is to make sure that these uh, inverters, for example, are smart. So we are collecting a lot of uh, data uh, from these inverters, uh, so you understand what the grid conditions are how the uh, product is performing how you know the uh, the consumers are using the loads right and when this happens right at the uh, you know edge level right uh, edge of the grid right it can really uh, make a tremendous uh, impact you know in terms of the transformation right and that's kind of how how we are driving this and so you know just to kind of um, summarize in a couple of points right one is as uh, uh, you know, Dr. Shiv said, right? I mean, there's going to be a lot of focus on physical uh, digital innovation. So the there is so much of um, uh, software and I would say all power system engineers across the world should learn uh, more software tools, especially the because that's rapidly changing and evolving. So they should be very conversant with digital, you know, tools and all that. Uh, look at uh, things at a system level perspective, right? I mean, overall, the, uh, you know, uh, it's an end to end. It's not like a component you know, kind kind of level, and and basically, you know, keep uh, end consumer and prosumer in their minds, uh, because I mean, they will uh, drive the transformation, and and uh, you know, they'll be an integral part of this whole thing, right, uh, going forward. So the opportunity over the next few years, I would say, is, is just tremendous, and it's really a, you know, uh, uh, for I would say we're fortunate to be in this uh, in this particular field doing doing R and D. So it's going to be very exciting going forward. Thank you so much. That's very, very well put. Thank you so much. And then I think uh, uh, your point about doing the basic hygiene first in terms of, uh, you know, doing the metering, trying to cut down on the pilferage, et cetera, that's going to really step up uh, the visibility on what is happening in the last mile. And that's a very valid point. And then your point about uh, imparting intelligence in terms of smart inverters and using them to, you know, do if you can call network tomography to understand what is happening, you know, or around you, that's, that's another, that's the other way. Of course, uh, trying to understand the impact of loads, which are not there, like EVs, space heating, et cetera, maybe simulations, I think would come into the play. Beautiful. I think, and th thank, thanks so much for, you know, uh, lining out these three techniques that probably using, helping us to work on the channel. Thank you so much. Okay, now let, let me go. Thank you. Sir. Let me now go to, the other side of the story, maybe to uh, Dr. Prashant Navalkar. So even Kannan, uh, I mean, he talked about you know renewables, etc. He was first point he mentioned was more about the bulk uh, farms like wind farms and solar farms, which are connected at the transmission side. So that's going to that's a different level. That's a, that's more like the network core where you know these volatile sources are getting uh, attached and. Ultimately, once we get to the point of, uh, you know, uh, uh, once we get to the point of pushing power back from the, uh, you know, prosumers back to the grid, it's going to have an impact on the transmission side as well. So I just want to hear your thoughts on you know, how do you think a transmission system is sort of geared up for handling both these challenges and what is it they're doing currently? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Venkatesh, for having me here. Um, uh, I mean, to follow to wonderful uh, talks is a bit difficult, but I'll try. So uh, I will actually take off where uh, Dr. Kanan, uh, uh, Kanan sort of ended and uh, maybe end at where uh, uh, Dr. Shiv, uh, uh, Shiv was pointing at. So uh, the first, I mean, I, you talked of transmission grids, but uh, I would like to mention uh, in very brief, if you would allow me, about the distribution uh, networks itself. As uh, Dr. Kanan said, 
we need some hygiene there we need meet, basic metering efficiency etc there also the integration of renewables and the improvement of the grid itself has to go hand in hand because you know you as of today you need the grid for the renewables to to be even to generate okay we don't have grid farming inverters yet uh, and uh, you know the standards are also just evolving the ieee 2800 2022 has just come out in fact it's very comprehensive so um, you know to uh, uh, you know 15 years ago you couldn't have just connected the solar inverter to the grid because the grid quality the power quality itself was so bad but now with improvement in technologies and all that it's possible also like you know you have contingencies like storms etc you are not able to you are not now even today you will not be able to because there's no grid if there is a storm you have the you have the uh, uh, wherewithal you have the resource but you you can't generate power unless you have storage or something like that so to uh, to be even able to uh, and to extrapolate this further maybe you had you can form some micro grids etc and uh, where you have grid farming inverters okay now moving on to the uh, i mean this is just a point that i made and uh, moving on to the transmission side which uh, you specifically asked about uh, uh, dr shiv mentioned some uh, uh, some issues like volatility which is which we uh, power engineers generally refer to it as intermittency okay uh, that is a problem and uh, 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 there are other issues also like renewable drought for example so the, you have uh, uh, there is a, a there is a drought and there is a curtailment also you know you have sometimes over generation in the renewable uh, side so uh, these are you know this is a dichotomy if you will but it has to be addressed um, then you have things like low inertia you uh, uh, the uh, the um, generators the older uh, generators had they were rotating machines right they had huge amount of inertia and that sort of helped the that energy energy is stored energy in the end so that helps the grid operator in terms of the stability of the grid etc so if those go away we did us uh, we we are actually doing a study and in, in uh, we are trying with the reduced levels of inertia what happens to the pre- frequency profile so if you reduce the frequency profile if you reduce the inertia by say 20% then uh, the uh, the mean sort of remains the same but the standard deviation goes from say 0.04 hertz to 0.065 hertz or something so you know the uh, peakiness increases in that sense so uh, that's that's another problem so uh, a solution to to quite a few of these problems is storage okay but then storage uh, brings about its own a set of uh, challenges in terms of uh, first of all is economics today storage is about 11 to 13 rupees a kilowatt hour so unless you have a portfolio as uh, dr shiv also said you have a portfolio you know you have a, a renewable plus uh, storage portfolio in which you also offer other services like um, uh, ancillary services network op- network control services uh, you are not going to be able to justify the investment uh, of the storage so uh, that's that's a point uh, which has to be um, uh, if you if you if however if you uh, if you make it a part of the ancillary services then you have 22 rupees per kilowatt hour generators getting scheduled as uh, uh, ancillary service so that can fly so uh, these are uh, problems which are uh, increasingly becoming interconnected so uh, storage uh, I, 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 as i mentioned storage can be one uh, solution but then storage itself gets tied to planning so when you plan the transmission network planning planning uh, till now was so, sort of a reactive process you know thermal power plants take 5 years plus to come up so as transmission planners we didn't bother we'll see when it comes you know It, it actually i mean this is a layman's uh, term but it was actually what was happening but now you need to be more proactive uh you need to uh, you know um, uh, sort of second guess where the investments will come where the plants will be located sort of the forecasting part and uh, also where the storage will be sited can you go to site storage with the uh, generation or should it be sited at the consumer end or the prosumer end both require storage but then the transmission planning paradigm completely changes if you site it at the generator end versus at the at the uh, prosumer at the consumer end the order the difference in investments is about 60% i mean uh, the uh, because you are, if you charge uh, located at the consumer end you have to uh, you have to carry all that charging and discharging uh, power as, as well so you know that is another problem as uh, i mean i keep coming back to dr shiv's uh, presentation is that you have a co optimization problem 
you have you have a transmission traditionally the transmission planning problem could be solved in a mi traditional milp kind of framework but you have a transmission you have the uh, uh, renewable and you have the storage so you can i mean uh, there are people working on this uh, co uh, co optimization sort of problem and finally if uh, i mean i come back to the uh, distribution part if the distribution uh, uh, I, i'm i'm sure you'll permit me one minute of that is that if the distribution uh, uh, it uh, if the bss or the battery storage has to act as a as a distribution energy resource or a distribution network control uh, point then you need all the supporting it and the supporting uh, uh, infrastructure in terms of you know peer to peer i need the uh, price data i need the forecasting data i need uh, other load data i need my own microgrid data so uh, i see all that coming beautifully together in what dr shiv presented and uh, i think uh, that's all i want to say and again i as both of them as i have said uh, it's a very exciting time i wish i was a student now you know, instead of <laughs> being close to retirement that uh, we could start all over again thank you so much Uh, Doctor, uh, Doctor Venkatesh, I think you are on mute. Yes, I am. I was on mute. Thanks for pointing it out. So I, I could see the passion in what you are saying. So thanks, thanks a lot. And your point about you know low inertia, I think that's very. Uh, I mean, that's that's a very well valid point to make the grid resilient. I think that's a very important problem. And then solution, possible, you know, good planning, sizing, storage sizing. placement could be good solutions i agree and it is it's interesting that you pointed to economics because that was going to be my next question to uh, shankaran okay so uh, so at about whatever you know prashant said at the end of the day uh, i may have lot of technologies but if the economics don't make sense in terms of you know having enough opportunities to derive make my investment viable in the long term it's not going to make it in the real world so from and the way economics sort of finds its place in the power system is through markets and given that your experience in you know power markets so how do you foresee uh, you know do you see that markets are going to change a little bit to allow for more services and more products if i can call them to come in so that our uh, distribute uh, the, the to sort of aid the uptake of things like storage and renewables which will make not only the operations smoother but also you know the investment also much more attractive so uh, that that's one question second question is um i think um, shiv talked about hydrogen so do you foresee you know markets where we will have uh, electricity hydrogen and different forms of energy sort of coming together because at the end of the day the consumer is going to consume all of them right i may have a heating based on hydrogen electricity etc so since the consumer is connected coupled so any thoughts on coupled markets yeah. or to thanks can you hear me yes okay thank you very much venkatesh and uh, excited to be here and you know my bio didn't say i apologize and i grew up in metur a beautiful town on the banks of uh, river kave wonderful place i call it a paradise <laughs> since it's too far away and then you know come and call it technology in coimbatore for my bachelor's and then the rest of it is my grad school phd and uh, siemens and so forth and uh, i have to quickly say what siemens does because that's one of the rules for us to sit here and be on a <laughs> camera in front of people and also so excited to see a lot of students are here and thanks to acm and thanks to tcs for pulling all of us together taking pains to cover different aspects of the problem so that you get the cross sections of view from multiple angles to define the whole uh, problem uh, and siemens grid software is part of the smart infrastructures this siemens grid software especially takes care of uh, electricity market operators large system operators reliability coordinators then comes transmission management system so we call it the energy market management system the transmission management system where all the you know uh, state estimation or contingency analysis and all of that 
uh, information to their SCADA and so forth. A distribution management system, and as Kanan already explained, you know, how do they work? Advanced uh, techniques, uh, dis distributed energy resource management systems, uh, and building management systems. All of these come under grid software. We don't produce, sorry, we don't make any hardware, but we come up with technique solutions to put them all together all the way from system operator or market operator down to buildings and rooftops and so on. think of it that way. So the entire spectrum we cover. And personally, I've had a, the privilege of working in uh, the electricity markets right from the very beginning. Right from the very first market design showed up in 2000 and all the way today, I, you know, I, I breathe and work in, <laughs> in that, that space. The best uh, way I wanted to connect, I had sort of an idea in the beginning, I threw it all away after listening to Shiv and Kanan and Prashant for the wonderful uh, you know, way they brought in the story of the technology, the solutions uh, and the pain parts in the distribution side and, and Prashant's, uh, you know, even the concern about system strength and all of it. These are wonderful points so that any transformation has to be extremely responsible. And for us to sustain a positive transformation Economically, it has to be sustained. So I'll take the first part. First part is the question is, is there a marketplace? Is there one? So, okay, if there is one, what all aspects of distributed energy resource or in the distribution side can be monetized? Then comes, where are you? Where do you want to go? So we'll take it quickly. It's try to take a one minute slices of the five minutes you've given me. Let me try quickly. What all can be monetized? That's, that's, that's the first thing. I need to know what can I monetize if I'm sitting in the distributed energy resort all the way. There's way up there is a market operator and goes through sub-transmission, distribution, sub-transmission, transmission, uh, system operator, market operator. I'm way down in the chain. What can be monetized? The wholesale market example will give a pretty good idea. So for example, in the wholesale market, uh, there are two things that need to be done in the wholesale market. And she pointed out very nicely, there's a forward balancing or scheduling. Second is, what it is, is think of it as uh, today at 11 a.m. right now, let's just say, you know, right now it's about 10 a.m. here. For 10 a.m., yesterday, we would have decided based on all the forecasts, different techniques that she explained, be forecast what's going to be there on the grid at that time, what kind of network configuration is there. Then we, there's a massive optimization of what we call energy and reserve as a co-optimization manner. I'm explaining a US market. What does it mean? The energy is real meaning the electrons going in, uh, you know, and then they're drawn out. Think of that as energy. What is the ancillary service? Suppose if demand is fluctuating, there is a reserve called regulation reserve. Renewables are fluctuating, ramping reserves. Or, uh, you know, for people who are in control system, there are students who are in control system. There is a primary control, there's a secondary control, and there's a tertiary part of it. So the primary part is, which Prashant touched upon it uh, very nicely, that's a system strength. So this is a proxy. There's inertia is there. We need inertia. It's not going to be there. Let's face it, <laughs> what are you going to do, right? So you, you're going to see more and more frequency response all over the world because it becomes a necessity, even if you are interconnected, large grid like US or India, it doesn't matter. You have to worry about system strength. And how are you going to do that? So we'll come to that. So all of these are monetizable, that's the point. And regulation, and then the tertiary point of view, if there is a generator trips, Within 10 minutes, you got to get the show under control. For transmission trips, 30 minutes, you get your show under control. How do you do that? You're going to move. So there are a lot of course moves that can happen in balancing. That what she said, balancing is, that word is not even a figure of speech. It's literally a balance. Think of the balance, demand and supply. Right? So literally that. And every minute you need to worry about it, every minute and every second for that matter. And so, so all of these you need to worry about. In other words, there are so many. Now, already we got it. The energy, 
regulation reserve, ramping reserve, uh, you know, spinning reserve, non-spinning reserve. All of these are monetized. Now let's see, can distribution, DER, can you, what all can it provide? So renewable, given that you are going to have extreme intermittency, you need to consider that not as a nuisance, you need to consider that that's a, that's a physical property. You are an engineer, I'm an engineer, deal with it. So if, if you take in that manner, so there are coarse moves are there, there are fine tuning, there's a fine tuning. That's why in the balance, right? You put in, add a little weight, <laughs> if the, you know, it goes this way, you adjust it, yeah, how do, there's no other way. So there are coarse move and fine tuning moves. So the coarse moves, can happen in so many different ways because system operators are also, they can't wait forever for something to happen. You know, so that's a, so that tells you the DER has to have properties of being fast. Another thing is the DER, I need to find the property, find some technology, whatever I do. I had to make it fast enough to be able to monetize those aspects. Second, I'll ask the question, how much can you move? The course moves, for example, Course moves, I'll give you a pretty quick example. Tamil Nadu has way too much renewable energy. Grid can't take it. They curtail it. Maharashtra needs it. But they don't understand. That happened in five minute period. So in other words, the forecast is next five minutes tells you there's going to be excess renewable in one place. And there is a, so in a huge diverse geography there is always a deficit, there is always a surplus. So how can you quickly decide in the next five minutes period, I am going to give you 2000 megawatt of renewable, bring down all your thermal for the 2000, can you handle it in five minutes? If you can handle it, I can give you that. That decision, these are called imbalanced markets. See, so now there are so many ways, the marketability of, uh, in any generation is there. Now let's come to distributed energy resources. So the first question for you is how many ways something can be monetized? Is there a financial, how do I say? Is there a market structure that exists? Yes, market structure exists. Then why can't you do it? Now we'll come to that. What all needs to happen to be able to do that, right? So for example, I'll just take California system as an example, 50 gigawatt of uh, peak demand, say 25 gigawatt of uh, renewable uh, peaks can, will happen in California. 12 gigawatt of DER is already there today. Think about that, 12 gigawatt of DER today. 400 batteries are coming every week since last September. <laughs> so so just, just imagine those numbers, right? And then about three gigawatt of uh, Transmission side, massive storages are there. So, so, so many places to juggle, right? Now let's quickly zero in on distributed energy resource point we said. Where does it come into play? All of us who have been through the renewable energy chain, the transformation in the, all over the world, one thing we know in the last 10 years, why did renewable energy start growing like Moore's law? Every year you see twice the last years. How is that? Of course, it's good for the society, good for the climate. We all understand this. Where's the money? Point is, once I install it, how much I spend for insulation will come to that. Once I install it, the cost of incremental cost of one extra unit of energy is 0, 0.0. There's nobody, nobody can beat you. It's extremely competitive. Draw the same analogies as the DER. What is the incremental cost of certain road getting reduced or some generations provided? If I can get it to 0, 0.0, I win. And the regulators will come to me, people will come to me, solution providers will come to me, it'll happen. So how do I do that? If I'm balancing the entire you know, generation demand, if I'm balancing in a sense, the theoretical maximum is all of the demand. That's the theoretical maximum I can use. We all know that's not realizable, you know, like in a marketing 
you know, what is the realizable or addressable market? Addressable market is different from realizable market. For the realizable market, then the question comes. Uh, you know, if you're going to be in balancing side of it, if you need to provide, you should be able to either generate or consume. Can you do that? That question comes. How do I do that? I'm all demand all over the place. Some generation I have, oh, how do I go back and forth? Storage. Right? So essentially, if I need to be in different fine-tuning monetizable aspects of marketability or monetizability, I would have storages all over. I think that trend is given. Nobody can stop it anymore because we all understood it. Because originally our idea was renewable energy was cheaper, good for the climate. Good for the climate came later, remember. None of us said renewable energy was cheaper. That's how we all went into it. Now, what are we saying? Zero carbon, net zero. Where is net zero going to happen? If there is not enough renewable, I need to turn on a gas generator. I have no other choice. Can I? If I have to, I will. Do I have to? That's where the DER comes with an answer. Hey, you don't have to. You got to do certain things to me. I'll become monetizable and I'll give you what you want. That elasticity, the local elasticity you need to worry. So if you quickly take the wholesale market, there's also another thing we do, you know, Kandan pointed out nicely about the, you know, the outages and so forth. These days, the systems are so much autonomous I shouldn't say totally autonomous, somewhat automated even for the outages on the system operator side. Still, the condensed problem is extremely valid. That has to be solved, you know, no, no doubt. But during the time it's restored, what do you do, right? So all of these preventive techniques have come into play for more than 10 years now. I protect you for the first contingency, meaning any transmission line anywhere trips, Already the dispatch I gave you is safe. The operator can sit back and just see it happen. Nothing, they don't, they don't need to do anything for even a large transmission trip, large generator trip. You don't have to do anything. Dispatch is already managed because those contingencies have been simulated. Certain flows have been verified. How it's going to settle down has been checked out. So there's no issue. So the same aspects of congestion management will have to be in the distribution also because all over the place now the power flows are going to come because it's always used to be one way. All of a sudden you are saying some places is bi-directional. Oh, I may like to take it from sub-transmission to transmission also once in a while. Okay, so then you're caught. There's a congestion need to be managed. So now quickly mapping back to what needs to be done. What needs to be done if you were to look at it, one is if you are also in the market, then there's a transparency is needed. That's where all this metering or all of the uh, forecasting technique, machine language, all of it is there. Because if I have to give somebody some money for producing something, I need to see it. If I can't see it, you just told me I did it. That's not enough. So the transparency is, so that's where all of these, uh, you know, all these machine language based assessment, are you capable? Because just because you tell me you can give, I can't trust you. I don't know, right? I have to run the grid. So I can't say, you know, Sankaran offered so much of my word, suddenly he disappeared. I don't know what to do. He can't say that, right? So the transparency, the machine language, artificial intelligence, also to check you out. Can you do it? Can this person do this? Yeah. So I need to know. I can't trust somebody like that, right? So all of these come into play. It all fits into places. So essentially, that, that you know, uh, these markets have worked with the forward side. So it's the same way you need to do. Another lesson I would like to say, why didn't, so you had another question. Are there facilities now? Yes. Demand response, for example, demand response is one of the reserves. For the reserves, you get paid. But if the reserves become realizable, then the energy payments are also there. In other words, you're given a fee or a rent just to say I am available. And then additional money is given once you activate it. And I need to see it visibly. I'll check your meters out, then I'll pay you. This is how the deals work, right? In the markets. Uh -huh. So think of it. Uh, so where am I going with it is demand response did not serve, do justice at all. The simple reason is you have to plan it in. 
Demand response clearly says, suddenly I need something, I'm going to use you. In other words, I'm just keeping you as a, you know, uh, on the back of plan B. Plan B, we want to make the DER as plan A. How do you make it as a plan A? Unless it gets into a forward market, this much of DER is going to come into the wholesale as a planned one, you're not going to see monetization. Oh, if it's all, plan Bs will never work. Not never work. Plan Bs only take the top. So thank you. Essentially, hopefully this gives the picture. And going back to hydrogen, hydrogen is absolute necessity because I live in a country uh, where... Sh Shankar, I'm, probably what we'll do I, is maybe we'll come back to this. Maybe if I just, uh, I'm just... Uh, Sorry. No, 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 no. Thank you. I mean, you gave an excellent answer about you know trying to you know make sure that don't curse the physics, just live with it and accept the volatility as a property and learn to deal with it. That's a very good mentality to have. We talked about elasticity having through storage, etc. That's probably a, another excellent point. And uh, transparency, right? I mean, if I want to have markets for DERs, then I need to make sure that I can trust the other person. And probably some things like, uh, hopefully things like blockchain, et cetera, could come there. I do not know. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you so much for us. Thank you we'll so put much. Put it on the LinkedIn for those. Uh, no sure. Thank you. Sorry Thank you so I blew much. the time. Yeah. No, no. Uh, take it easy. Take it easy. Thank you so much. And probably the next question is for Shiv. Shiv, maybe at a high level as an outsider, I see some similarities between um, the computer network and the energy network. Okay. Like we have a core. We have uh, edge, uh, we have intelligence, etc. So maybe are there any maybe couple of points you would like to suggest that we can learn from our experience from computer networks onto the energy in internet? Yeah, <clears throat> in the spirit of time, I'll keep it brief. Uh, so I think I'll just uh, highlight two or three important points. One is that, uh, like uh, our other <clears throat> panelists have mentioned, the grid is a real-time supply chain, right? So there is a similarity when telephony was there. It was also sort of like a synchronous supply chain or uh, close to uh, real-time, near real-time circuits with supply chain. It moved to a a uh, more flexible supply chain through the internet, right? We had packets that provide buffering. It could be flexible uh, <clears throat> provisioning between, you know, in terms of how much capacity you provision and so on, right? And you'd had buffers and uh, you had more software-based controls, right? So I think um, similar transition is happening on the energy side, right? A move from synchronous to, uh, uh, you know, more uh, flexible, right? Or uh, asynchronous and, or not completely asynchronous, but has some asynchronous properties, buffering properties, and so on. That's number one. Number two is uh, uh, a move towards more decentralized controls enabled by markets, right? So uh, in the in the uh, internet, you moved from, you know, centralized controls and, uh, you know, circuits which uh, networks uh, were typically controlled by centralized, uh, uh, you know, sort of algorithms towards more decentralized controls where we had TCP IP, where you uh, essentially see when a packet gets dropped or, you know, essentially get a shadow price and uh, then make a decision, you know, completely decentralized way. Now here again, we are seeing decentralized controls driven by more explicit prices driven, uh, uh, you know, deliver through a variety of energy markets, right? So there is day head markets, intraday markets, ancillary services market, flexibility markets, carbon markets, <clears throat> and, uh, and and the like, right? Uh, ancillary services markets and so on. So I think um, that uh, trend uh, is the second one, right? Prices from markets driving decentralized controls. And the third is uh, sort of increasing um, sort of um, a transformation driven by space and time shifting uh, to smooth the volatility, right? Space shifting is through traditional network transmission distribution and so like. Time shifting is through batteries and other flexibility resources. Um, and um, finally, I would say that uh, the internet uh, is a network of networks, right? So the, there's a concept of autonomous systems which can operate autonomously and they choose to connect to other autonomous system because it's beneficial for them. Similarly, we will have microgrid domain means that uh, tries to do as much as possible with the local energy resources, but you choose to connect um, and, uh, you know, and benefit by that interconnection, right? So again, uh, so these are some of the sort of, I would say, uh, paradigms, I think, that are similar. But of course, you have to always respect the physics is going to be different in uh, in energy. And um, uh, I think uh, the interesting combination of uh, studying power systems from uh, electronics as well as um, uh, electrical engineering and uh, learning digital and uh, computer science, um, I think this is a wonderful area to uh, leverage both of us. Back to you. Thank you so much. I think you, the, the, the talk, my party talked about, you know, moving in space and time. EVs maybe could do both. Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, yeah. So th thank you so much. And maybe uh, Sanjay, I mean, now we, we go to the 
driver behind the organization right we have we talk about utilities etc and with all this automation intelligence etc we feel that there there has to be a lot of data exchange happening between different segments of utility industry it has to happen in a seamless way i think chankaran talked about being transparent trustworthy etc so auditability etc i think those things will come into play here and uh, from your experience in across you know variety of you know it's being ceo of several companies my apologies i think uh, yeah i'm back of ceo of several companies uh, could you please maybe share your thoughts on how you think the drivers of the next generation energy internet is sort of influencing the policies of the underlying it in in utility companies yeah thank you yeah uh, thank you venkatesh i think uh, uh, first thanks to uh, tcs and ecm for inviting me and what has actually been a learning session for me for the last one hour and uh, uh, i'll it's and also thanks to you know uh, the speakers because uh, almost everything has been spoken so i'll try to see if there is anything else that i can come out with and keep the audience alive so uh, you know uh, jeremy rifkin who's talked about energy internet uh, he talks uh, he refers to it as the third industrial revolution so in the same aspect i'm looking at some market drivers for utility and uh, utility is also in its third uh, generation as well you know the classical utility 1.0 was when uh, there is to be one power company and it's to be a pensioners paradise globally and uh, that's it and then uh, with the electricity act in 2003 uh, you know gradual unbundling of uh, gtv happened and we had captive consumers with uh, limited choices in some jurisdictions for instance um, uh, you find in mumbai that uh, you know there is obviously uh, competition between the three players the three discoms whereas in delhi you have specific jurisdiction within the uh, ncr area uh, in which they play as a single player so but with the cusp of deregulation that is coming in uh, you know the consumers will be left with choice uh, and uh, the separation of wire and supply would come in and there will be a provider <clears throat> who holds the last mile uh, who needs to behave like a retailer like we have seen in uk in, you know so 10 12 years back so keeping that in mind and the esg compulsions that are driving uh, this particular industry today a mature utility would typically speak of four drivers uh, or four d's that we call uh, essentially uh, digitalization decarbonization decentralization and de risk underpinned by the deregulation that we just spoke about in doing so we'll find there's an overlap of the technology components relevant to smart grid which is anyway a building block to the energy internet so i'll not get into every aspect of the technology components but they would largely touch assets consumers process and employees so an itot integration in the uh, utility industry has been a given for several years and that has got accentuated with iit sensorization with edge decision making uh you have the digital twin for substations which help us in network planning and operational efficiency through dynamic monitoring with uh, with predictive uh, critical asset maintenance then we have the drones for monitoring the tnb assets and leading to optimal uh, a flight plan and analysis of the asset condition and then i think uh, there was a reference to basic hygiene which is energy theft minimization and on the other side on business processes utility business processes you had cycle time reduction and accuracy of uh, those processes digital voice assistants to supplement the contact center uh, to deliver in a language of choice for the consumer uh, in his or her language has also been a reality of the day and of course lastly the combination of uh, gis uh, crm and you know, gis with consumer index indexing crm and scada together actually ties up the asset consumer and the employee levers <coughs> in 
in terms of decarbonize ev battery storage uh, was mentioned then i am very happy that uh, there was a reference to electric heating and cooking also in dr shiv's presentation because it's not very fancy thing to put up on a, uh, you know in such fora but that it is including the legacy it virtualization now when we talk about the ev ecosystem uh, there are components of the vehicle itself the system equipment the charging point ops and the managed service provider for the fleet for the public and for the you know the residential residential as well as for the non residential um now there is a chance for somebody to play a mere broker for the charging point infrastructure or for being a master that is uh, apart from that integrating with the smart grid solution and and lastly maturing into a governor covering every aspect of the ev ecosystem so uh, why i mention this because <clears throat> you know, there uh, i would slightly differ with uh, i think uh, uh, dr kannan when he says that ev loads you know change due to mobility and uh, you know whenever they are charging and that's a disadvantage conversely when you are looking at vehicle to grid uh it's the same vehicle which is has the flexibility to offer something to the grid uh when it is lying uh you know idle in the residential complex or the parking lot and the sigma of that would bring it uh, would provide it that you know critical mass in future to do that balancing in terms of <coughs> sorry in in terms of uh, uh some of the technology interventions for smart grid you know uh, substation automation includes self healing along with the consumer portal systems to make sure that obviously the communication is reaches back to the consumer and completes the whole loop uh, 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 along with the diagnosis that one is able to do with a uh, uh, consumer indexing with gis and even the home automation behind the meter which uh, essentially uh, you know creates that uh, uh, element of microgrid between the vehicle to grid and the uh, um, battery energy battery <coughs> sorry uh, the battery and as well as uh, distributed energy resources and in terms of uh, the communication technology which was earlier you know automated meter reading that has got uh, matured into what we today call the ami the automated meter infrastructure which facilitates the facilitates the two way communication between the consumer and the utility and as we think of uh, the next gen the, the same ami would probably mature into what we call as aim or the ai meter which will do everything that the ami does but will also take into account external control signals of the environment as well as the consumer of course uh, with the uh, privacy clause attached to it and uh, in terms of uh, there is one point which i sort of uh, missed out in the um, uh, as part of the ev ecosystem is uh, design has to improve significantly to allow that multiple charging and discharging cycles otherwise the life of that in uh, you know, the life of the battery would uh, really be questionable yeah. in future thank you uh, in terms of in terms yes. of uh, sorry uh, i i Uh, you know uh, this the same microgrids when clustered together would lead to the you know the virtual power plants which were referred to in also dr shiv's slide and uh, that would help sort sort of smooth in the curve in the future and we have seen examples from tesla in south australia tesla in california uh, to have really done that where uh, you know grid outages have been severe because of natural disasters and and that has been able to break to some extent in uh, in smoothing the curve i would now you know in the interest of time i would touch upon the d risk portion uh, where it is uh, in the impact is twofold one is obviously from the natural disasters and the other is cyber security uh, ident identifying and detecting and responding has always been a challenge and which got accentuated during the pandemic and ai assisted automation has helped to a certain extent and i would i would uh you know not do justice if i didn't mention that the government initiatives in the space to ministry of power and ministry of it have moved several notches over the past few years 
in, in enabling our readiness for the future. Uh, some of the initiatives like setting up of sectoral certs, you know, in thermal transmission, distribution, hydro, renewable, and the grid operations, and priority given to the LDC, the load dispatch centers and the major discounts and generation stations over a certain capacity has really uh, brought out the concept of critical information infrastructure and protected system. And typically one would count uh, the SCADA networks and the distributed control system, which would fall in this category. And, uh, and at the same time, the responsibilities of utilities are also expected to sort of supplement this in terms of uh, responding to the advisories of different uh, agencies of uh, uh, Ministry of IT and Ministry of Power, namely the sectoral search, certain, and NCII PC. What, what has been the impact with respect to the OEMs of uh, you know, such utilities? Security by design, trusted uh, OEM sources for uh, assets that are getting procured, uh, you know, which is priority scanning, et cetera and testing them at CPRI or designated centers so that, uh, again, these are ready for, uh, as we open up to this uh, whole concept of an extended smart grid or the uh, energy internet. 2.78 from this uh, particular example. One is the, a data model. So a data model like the common information model is almost uh, you know, a de facto standard which has been accepted by IEC for uh, coming out with a common language format for different power systems and applications to exchange information. And is often read with several uh, other protocols of IEC. Uh, and I understand uh, that Kusoko is, all, uh, is a big player who is supporting this initiative. And I, she could correct me because Microsoft is also one of the players who endorses this in a big way uh, globally. I. Uh, Heard a reference on ADR a little earlier by Dr. Shankaran. So I would like to hear from him where does open automated de demand response stand? Because that is also you know, heavily backed by uh, utilities of the US as well as uh, the, department, uh, the Department of Energy. One uh, positive outcome, I would just take a half a minute. One positive outcome that uh, emanates from this is Utility OEMs are also therefore under a lot of pressure as we heard in the last 30 seconds. So generative design for utility OEMs become a reality as we move from GPT 3.0 in 2020 to uh, now what we hear of GPT 4.0 because this optimal design at the early stage product will give the, give the OEMs wherewithal not only with respect to the cost and material but also with respect to cybersecurity features and in turn, we lower the total technology cost of ownership for the utility. So I think uh, at this point, uh, Vikatesh, I had a few more points to go ahead with respect to the similarities between the two internets, but anyway, for in the interest of time, I'll pass it on to you and so that we can have a much more. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. I think, uh, my apologies, we start a few minutes late and uh, I'm sorry about that. Thanks for it. excellent points and maybe observing the best for the last Best question for the last, Professor Kohli. I think um, uh, academia has always been the you know the vital engine that sort of uh, churns out all the innovations in almost all vertical, all industry verticals, and power system is sort of no different. And given that uh, Sanjay talked about a lot of government initiatives that have come uh, to sort of you know uh, which aids the transformation in the utility industry. From your point of view. Oh, do you think there are enough things that the government is doing to sort of uh, enhance the collaboration between academia and industry, especially for tech transfer and things like that? That's number one. Is there anything more we could do uh, to sort of accelerate this uh, transformation to the sustainable internet? So okay, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so thanks, Venkatesh. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Thank you. Okay. So uh, first of all, again, <laughs> I'm reiterating the thank you but that everybody has given. I think this is a great panel. It's been a really great learning experience just listening to uh, the esteemed panelists. And I feel a little bit of a, a green person right now, like a novice. I don't know exactly what all I could say, but uh, just to very quickly, uh, very specifically talk of government in, uh, initiatives that focus on industry, academia, 
collaboration. Uh, that's what I would like to focus on. Uh, so recently, what we in academia are seeing is there's a lot of push from uh, funding agencies like uh, DST, a Department of Science and Technology here in India, even SERP for that matter, Science uh, uh, and Engineering Research Board of India for translational research. So where they're really encouraging uh, two plus two sort of participation, maybe an academia and industry from India partner up with an academia and industry partner from uh, some other, you know, Indo-German, Indo-French sort of setups. Uh, these have existed, but there's a lot more accelerated focus on these sort of partnerships. And there's a lot of uh, emphasis being given for these sort of partnerships. And a lot of it is, in fact, what I'm learning now as I'm getting more and more entrenched in this system is a lot of it comes also from top down government to government sort of participation. What is it that the governments want to focus on and work together in terms of clean energy partnerships. So that's an, a very interesting angle. Um, you get small uh, uh, funds as such, even from uh, you know uh, boards like CERB, uh, that if you have your research at a fairly mature stage, they'll give you some funds to make sure you can actually take it to TRL levels eight and nine and so on. And uh, so this is uh, very, very exciting. Uh, in terms of uh, other schemes, for example, I know uh, the uh, Ministry of Power very recently put up the RDSS scheme, right? Uh, uh, and uh, a part of that, they reached out, in fact, to a lot of IITs and a lot of NITs uh, to ask what sort of programs we could run, capacity building programs we could run uh, to work with the utility industry in terms of bringing, up, bringing them up to speed on what is the space for smart grid solutions out there. Uh, and in that sense, it's actually, you know, uh, one correction I would do on what you said, Venkatesh, is uh, academia is no longer the only leading researcher for innovation, right? I see a lot of work coming out of PCS for that matter. I know you've partnered up with professors in IIT where you put out great research papers out there, great patents are being put together. And I know Microsoft is doing this. I was in fact, uh, while preparing for this panel, I was looking at uh, uh, pro uh, uh, Shiv's profile and I see how many, you know, how much work <laughs> goes on at Microsoft as well. So this is very, very interesting space right now. And there's so much possibility for collaboration between academia and industry. And that's just, you know, I think we are just about touching the tip of the iceberg. Uh, one, uh, if I have a few minutes, one challenge that I, just a minute, one challenge that I see, for example, here is uh, oftentimes when the government puts an initiative together, let's have a consortia and uh, let academia and industry come together and solve a problem. Uh, the main problem is the alignment of timelines. So industry usually have time frames where they want turnaround times of a year and two years and so on. Uh, and, and that's not really a problem for the academia, but for the funding agencies, they have their cycles, which are a lot slower than anything that the industry wants or anything that the academia wants, which effectively, in a way, sort of, I'm sorry, I think I'm being politically incorrect. I'm sure I'm pissing somebody off uh, from the funding agency side. So please don't take away my funds. But, but this is true. I see this as a challenge because I've led a lot of... Uh, uh, I've done a lot of work on consortia building and I know what ends up happening is by the time the funds are actually available, the industry partner has lost interest in the problem. And that's that's a sad reality. And uh, that's something that we need to learn how to deal with. And th this is a message that needs to go to the funding agencies that these turnaround times probably need to be a lot quicker for these partnerships to be actually meaningful to both academia and industry. So... Those are my <laughs> volatile bombs that I wanted to drop. And <laughs> no, th th thank, you. thank you so much, Professor Kohli. I think uh, at times, you know, we are also uh, party to that in terms of getting back the cycle, cycle time and all those things. So I completely understand what you're saying. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And to all the panelists, this has been a great experience for me. I feel quite humbled to sort of, you know, to be the moderator. And uh, thanks for your time. I mean, apologies for you know, uh, being a few minutes off of the schedule. Uh, it's been a great learning experience. I'm sure that there'll be a lot of questions. I'll be, bomb I'll be getting a lot of questions. I'll pause them your way in the interest of time. Maybe let's probably end this session today. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, participation, panelists. 
to ACM and our, our technology partners for making this happen and for all the listeners as well. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukhtesh and the TCS and ACM. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you Good evening. Good day. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, so, <laughs> wherever you are. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. See you thank all. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.